one of my uh, favorite topics, um, that is uh, privacy and the law, and uh, I'm looking at it this morning specifically from the angle uh, that would interest uh, journalists, um, leaving aside the aspects of privacy dealing with uh, such rights as uh, right to choose uh, between abortion and childbirth and sexual intimacy and so forth. That's not my topic. My topic is the, the right of privacy uh, as it affects the media. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, first the common law and, uh, and the various torts that uh, the courts have recognized with regards to public disclosures and then I want to talk about uh, two specific federal statutes uh, that affect uh, the area. The common law by, uh, by uh, most regards is divided into uh, four recognized torts. They are uh, briefly called uh, the tort of intrusion, that of appropriation, false light in the public eye, and public disclosure of true private facts. And each of them in some way, uh, and, and to varying degrees, affect um, the, the, the media. Um, the first, the, the, the first tort is that of intrusion, um, which is uh, the various elements are intentional intrusion upon the solitude or seclusion or the privacy of another uh, where it is highly offensive, where the intrusion is highly offensive to a reasonable person. Uh, there is a West Virginia case. Uh, which illustrates the point. Uh, it's basically intrusion into a private space is, is what it comes down to. Uh, and there's a case uh, going back to the 50s. Uh, I believe the name of it is Roach versus somebody. It's an appropriately known case. You know, once you learn the facts, uh, it was a, a landlord here in Morgantown who rented to college students and he planted a bug in one of his uh, tenants' uh, apartments. Uh, apparently a nice looking young woman and I, somehow he <coughs> wanted to bug her, <laughs> and that's why Roach is an appropriate name for the case. Um, and, and the court recognized that that is, that is a, a, uh, an intrusion into private space, which uh, was actionable, and it's the first case in West Virginia recognizing a privacy cause of action. Uh, it comes up with regards to media in the context of news gathering. Uh, because obviously when you're gathering news, you're look, digging into things and trying to gather information. And uh, there are limits, however, to uh, what you can do. Uh, the most famous case with regards to this is a case called, uh, well, I don't know, I, I guess it would be Jalela, uh, G-A-L-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Uh, it's an Italian name, so I assume it's a soft G. Jalela versus Onassis, as in uh, Jacqueline Onassis. Uh, Ron Jalela was a paparazzo, and uh, he was constantly dogging uh, Jackie and her family. Uh, they were, this was a 1973 case, so the kids were still pretty small yet. And he did things like jump out in front of uh, John Jr. when he was riding his bicycle. Uh, he uh, bribed the doorman at their apartment in Manhattan uh, to inform him about his, the family's comings and goings. Um, he rented a motorboat and came dangerously close to Jackie while she was swimming uh, off the coast uh, and, uh, and, and was constantly sort of in their face and, and, and dogging them. And at some point in time, uh, Jacqueline took some sort of action against him and he then sued her um, for uh, some sort of uh, damages and then she uh, filed a counterclaim against him to get an injunction to keep him away and the district court did grant that. The Second Circuit limited the scope of the injunction saying, well, he's got a, he's got a constitutional right. He's got a right to gather news. He's got a right to uh, pursue uh, the family. They are, in fact, newsworthy by, almost by definition, uh, but uh, there are limits. Uh, and, and the Second Court uh, modified the injunction but did uh, uh, affirm the core of it saying, you gotta say, say uh, so many feet from the family you have to give them breathing space. Uh, you're entitled to, uh, to photograph them, but you, you have to provide some space. Um, the, uh, the, one of the statutes I'm going to talk about uh, affects it, it, um, this particular tort. It's the uh, Omnibus, Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act. I'll, I'll give you more details on that later. Suffice it to say, a federal statute limits um, 
uh, uh, well, not limits, it prohibits uh, basically intercepting oral conversations and electronic communications. Um, that came up in a uh, Supreme Court case sort of um, dealing with this particular issue. Uh, it was an instance, it wasn't an instance of news gathering because the, um, the, uh, the information obtained in that case was unlawfully obtained, but the news media uh, 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 themselves obtained it lawfully. Uh, it's a case called Bartnicki versus Vopper, um, which uh, was a 2001 case. Uh, the facts in this case are that uh, somebody apparently intercepted a, a cell phone conversation uh, involving a discussion between uh, a local teachers union president and one of his officers. Uh, the teachers at that time were on strike. It was a highly controversial strike, so there was lots of media attention to it. And in the course of this conversation, uh, the union president said basically, well, we're going to have to go to these board members' houses and we'll have to blow up, blow up their porches and uh, we're going to have to do something to get them to move. Uh, and somebody intercepted this conversation and taped it and then gave the tape to uh, a radio station. And, uh, and a newspaper as well. And both the radio station, the radio station played the tape on air, the newspaper published it. Uh, the part of the federal law says it is unlawful to intercept and it is unlawful to use uh, an, an unlawfully intercepted conversation. Uh, and of course the station and the paper were well aware this was an unlawfully intercepted tape. They had no idea who intercepted it, did not know how it was obtained, uh, but they received it uh, anonymously and they received it lawfully. So the Supreme Court said, uh, well, uh, this, uh, this invoking a, a well-established principle that uh, the uh, disclosure of lawfully obtained uh, information on, regarding a matter of public concern cannot be the subject of uh, criminal or civil liability absent a, a, uh, a, a state interest of the highest order. And the court said this was clearly a, a matter of public uh, uh, interest and uh, it was lawfully obtained and therefore a, as applied to this particular disclosure, the federal law was superseded by the First Amendment rights of the, uh, of the paper and the station. Now, uh, the federal law says basically you cannot intercept uh, an oral conversation uh, unless one of the parties consent to, consents to it. In other words, a person could, uh, for example, uh, tape their own telephone conversations um, or their conversations with anyone. Some states, uh, noticeably Pennsylvania and Maryland, prohibit the, t the uh, interception of conversations unless all parties to the conversation consent. Uh, and so you might recall the Linda Tripp case. Uh, she, uh, as I recall, lived in Maryland and, and was uh, thus subject to the Maryland law and uh, I believe there was some consideration for a time there about prosecuting her under the Maryland statute because, what's her name, Monica Lewinsky, had not consented to uh, having her uh, conversations taped and needless to say, neither did Bill Clinton. Um, so, so that's the intrusion toward it. It, it. it doesn't come into play very often with regards to media, but uh, nevertheless, it, it does uh, restrict uh, activities. Um, the appropriation tort. Um, the tort is um, the unauthorized use of a person's name or likeness for uh, commercial or personal gain. And this tort has elements of both uh, proprietary uh, property-like uh, interests as well as personal, personality kinds of concerns, uh, dealing with the feelings of the individual. And I'll give you an example of, uh, of each. Um, <coughs> with regards to the proprietary, th this, this tort was uh, addressed by the Supreme Court in a case called Zacchini, uh, Z-A-C-C-H-I-N-I, -I, uh, versus uh, Scripps Howard. Uh, Zacchini was, um, uh, uh, characterized himself or performed under the trade name of the human cannonball. Uh, he was one of these guys who shot himself out of the cannon and charged people admission to watch it. And a, a local TV station came to his act and uh, filmed the entire act, uh, which only lasted about, I think, 12 seconds to, you know, from the time the cannon shot off until he landed. It couldn't last too long, <laughs> uh, otherwise, uh, Zucchini wouldn't do it more than once. So, um, so they, they filmed the entire act, according to the Supreme Court, and, and then ran it on the, t on the nightly news. Uh, 
<laughs> and um, and then he sued the TV station. Scripps Howard owned it uh, uh, for basically appropriating his 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 act, and and the Supreme Court. Um, uh, recognized the tort, said that uh, basically this is like this is like uh, any of the other proprietary uh, causes of action under uh, patent and copyright and trademark and the like, uh, and that uh, and and emphasized too that the, uh, the the station had filmed the entire act and had played it back and and obviously received a certain amount of commercial gain out of it uh, and and uh, the, the, for that reason the uh, the uh, the court said uh, that the the tort was consistent with the First Amendment it was simply protecting uh, zucchini's proprietary interest on the other hand let me give you a case that uh, came up in, in uh, West Virginia there's a uh, uh, televangelist down in uh, Logan Domingo County, one of those counties. Um, guy by the name of West, uh, uh, Reverend West, and I, I forget his first name right now, but he's, he's fairly prominent in televangelism circles and, and has made his way around the, uh, around the, uh, the region. Uh, and a number of years ago, he was uh, conducting a um, revival down in North Carolina and uh, was engaged and was doing some faith healing. And there was a, the uh, National Geographic came in and was doing an article on um, North Carolina. And part of the article dealt with the sort of the religious uh, fundamentalism in the state. And they had a picture of Reverend West there with his hand on somebody's head and praying to God and so forth. It was uh, obviously a, an instance of uh, faith healing. Um, and and uh, he apparently, I think he consented to that photograph and did not object to it being uh, uh, printed and, and, and circulated through National Geographic magazine. Well, uh, several years later, one of his parishioners uh, is over across the, uh, across the river uh, in uh, Pike County, uh, Kentucky, and is in a uh, video store uh, looking for a movie to rent, and uh, comes upon a, a video with, um, featuring uh, Dennis Hopper as a, uh, a faith healer who's uh, somewhat, let's say, hypocritical. It's sort of a latter-day Elmore Gantry kind of movie. And, uh, uh, and and the and the, uh, the the box for the video uh, it has a, on its front a picture of Reverend West. It's the picture from National Geographic, which um, they have reproduced as uh, as a photograph to uh, to sort of uh, uh, don the cover of uh, of this uh, video rental box. Uh, and, and the parishioner is shocked uh, to see Reverend West in such a uh, commercial uh, stance. And so they, they take it back and they show Reverend West and uh, they're somewhat upset and he is horrified. Uh, he had never consented to this and um, they had simply used his likeness as a means for basically advertising the, uh, the movie. Uh, apparently, the uh, whoever distributed, whoever created the video and distributed it, just hired somebody to go through magazines <laughs> looking for pictures of, of uh, faith healers, and they came upon uh, Reverend West, and they just clipped it out and and uh, and used it. So uh, he sued, and uh, and and that's a perfect example of using his likeness for a commercial gain. Uh, certainly, uh, using his likeness without his consent, and the damages there are not so much proprietary as they are personal. He was personally offended by this. It, it damaged his feelings, and he felt damaged his reputation with his parishioners. Um, so the um, uh, it, and, uh, and I think the courts have generally recognized that as a, a, a viable tort. Um, the case did not go to court, by the way. It settled. I mean, it would seem to me it was so clear that the, uh, the defendant realized that they had uh, pretty clear liability in the case. Um, all right. So the third tort is this uh, false light in the public eye. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention at the outset, by the way, we'll have time for questions at the end, but if you want to interrupt me at any point, uh, please feel free to do so. I, I, I really don't mind that at all. Um, so the third tort, uh, false light in the public eye. Uh, the elements of this tort are uh, publicity, uh, which has meaning, publicity of false facts regarding uh, private affairs, um, and uh, the disclosure of which is highly offensive to the reasonable person. And, and each of these elements need uh, some explanation. Um, 
publicity means, uh, it, I should say too at the outset here, this tort has a lot of overlap with defamation. Uh, and the way in which the two work together is something which is in considerable flux. The defamation law has a lot of baggage with it, uh, and it's not clear that all of that baggage carries over to uh, false light in the public eye. Uh, in some sense, it's a broader tort. In some sense, it's, uh, senses it's a narrower, it's more narrow. Than, uh, than defamation. And, and it's, it's more narrow in the, in, in the sense of the first element, which is publicity. Uh, the, tort, the courts have, in applying this tort, have said there has to be more than just a communication to one person. Uh, you communicate a defamatory statement to one person, that, that's actionable. It, obviously, the number of people you communicate to uh, affects the uh, amount of damages, but um, Widespread publicity is an element of the cause of action with regards to false light in the public eye. Uh, it's not limited to media defendants, but it has to be a distribution which is of a broader scale. And of course, with today's internet, um, you can reach a lot of people in, in no time at all, even if you're not a, a media person. Um, so it, it, it must be publicity and it must be uh, false. Uh, falsehood is an element of the cause of action. Uh, and uh, it must relate to uh, private matters, the disclosure of which would be offensive to a reasonable person. It is uh, not uncommon to, uh, to see uh, a false light case joined with a defamation action. Uh, for example, um, accusing someone of, uh, falsely accusing someone of having uh, extramarital relations with another individual uh, would be, uh, if false, would be both defamatory, certainly would damage the reputation of the individual, but would also uh, be the disclosure of facts uh, relating to uh, private conduct and, uh, and thus could provide a cause of action for, for both. Um, and, uh, but the, the, the defamation action, of course, is concerned with injury to reputation, whereas the false light privacy tort is concerned with damage to uh, the personality, to feelings. It's, an, it's, it's really uh, concerned with uh, imposition of, of emotional distress. Uh, and I'll give you a couple examples of this, uh, both some that have been litigated and some that haven't. Um, the, the Supreme Court case on this is uh, Time Inc. versus Hill a decision from the mid-60s involving a family that had been the uh, object of, um, had been basically held hostage by a, a couple of escaped prisoners for a period of about 20 hours, I believe. Uh, and uh, it, the, uh, the, the event had been the subject of a, uh, of a play, <coughs> Desperate Hours, I believe, was the name of the play, and, and eventually a movie. Um, Humphrey Bogart was in it, and Frederick March, I believe, was fairly, uh, well-known movie in the uh, in the mid 50s and uh, and then it became uh, they revived it on Broadway in, in the mid 60s uh, and uh, um, Life magazine ran a, a feature article on the on the uh, on the revival and the article um, went into the what had been the Hill residence and took some pictures and photos and and had uh, and described what had happened and uh, misstated uh, some key facts with regards to the events that actually occurred to the Hills. I mean, the, the play was loosely based, it was actually a novel and then a play and then a movie, and the fictionalized versions were loosely based on the actual event. But Life magazine represented basically that uh, these events actually uh, occurred to the Hills, including um, some sexual uh, interaction, let's say, between the, the prisoners and the Hills' daughter, uh, which was false. And, and the Hills were deeply hurt by this, and so they sued under this uh, false light theory uh, and went up to the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, it, by the way, was the only appearance by Richard Nixon as, as an attorney before the Supreme Court. He, of course, was there several times as, as, as a party, but it was his, his only trip as a lawyer. Um, the, uh, so. Uh, so the, the, the court basically uh, recognizes this tort uh, and says that it can coexist with the First Amendment. The key issue in the case uh, and the key issue that remains with regards to the false light tort is uh, what's the, the standard that you have to show with regards to um, um, 
the, a fault on the part of the uh, defendant. And I need a little background on this. The, uh, you, you all know, of course, the, uh, the famous case, New York Times versus Sullivan, which says that uh, in reporting on a public figure, uh, a public figure may not recover against a um, defendant for uh, defamation, false statements with regard that damage the reputation, unless uh, the public figure plaintiff proves uh, actual malice. In other words, that the defendant published the falsehood with knowledge that it was false or in reckless disregard of the truth. Uh, a pretty high standard of uh, culpability. You have to, you have to show um, that there was more than just negligence. You have to show um, this actual malice. And then the Supreme Court later expanded that to, um, to include uh, public uh, figures. I said public figures before, I meant public officials. New York Times versus Sullivan involved a public official, and then they expanded that to say any public figure, private or public, has to um, meet this actual malice standard in order to recover under defamation. Uh, and then the court decides uh, that uh, that actual malice extends to any matter of uh, public interest, but reversed itself on that standard very shortly thereafter in a case called Gertz versus Welch, in which it said that if a private private figure brings a case of defamation, even if it's a matter of public concern, then the private figure may recover, or this, at least the states may allow recovery to a private figure merely upon a showing of negligence. You has to have to prove fault, uh, and you have to prove actual malice to get punitives, but uh, the lesser standard of negligence applies to private figures. So um, Gertz came after Time Inc. versus Hill. So, uh, and in Time Inc. versus Hill, the court said, if it's a publication which concerns a matter of public concern, and it didn't go into public figure versus private figure, then the plaintiff has to prove actual malice. So what remains an open question is, is whether Gertz qualifies that standard. Uh, the only Supreme Court case we have dealing with the appropriate standard for false light in the public eye was, uh, was Time Inc. versus Hill, and it said, um, you had to show actual malice, even though the, the hills in that case were private figures. Um, and, and let me give you a, a couple subsequent cases which raised the issue and, and dealt with it in different ways. Um, a subsequent Supreme Court case uh, applying this tort was a case called uh, Cantrell versus Forrest Publish Company, I think. Uh, it can't, the, uh, the publisher uh, published the uh, Cleveland Plain Dealer. And uh, the Cantrells were, um, lived in Point Pleasant, uh, and their Mrs. Cantrell's husband was in the uh, Silver Bridge collapse and had died in, in, that, in that tragedy. Uh, and the reporter in that case, I'm blanking on his name now, I, I should know it, he had won a Pulitzer Prize before, and uh, anyhow, he had, he had uh, written a story immediately after the tragedy on the impact of, of the uh, event on the uh, community in Point, Point Pleasant, including the Cantrell family. And then he came back a year later for a follow-up story, and the follow-up story was, uh, at least as, uh, as proved by the Cantrells in court, a jury uh, provided them with a, a jury verdict, uh, included some, uh, 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 just fall, flat out false statements uh, about the Cantrells and it put them in a bad light, a false light in the public eye, uh, it characterizing, the, uh, describing them as extremely poor and uh, forlorn and uh, all kinds of things that simply uh, weren't true apparently. Uh, and the court granted cert on the case to review that issue about actual malice, but uh, granted cert meant they the, uh, granted review. But uh, eventually, uh, they do not reach the issue because the, uh, the jury was instructed to determine, uh, to, de to decide the case under the actual malice standard. So the, the jury had already said, well, the plaintiffs here have proved actual malice, and so the court said, we don't need to get to the issue about negligence. Um, a, a couple other examples of the tort to sort of uh, flesh it out uh, a bit. Uh, one of the best examples of it that I've seen, um, this did not get litigated, but it, it really illustrates the point. This was about, uh, it's been about 30 years now. Uh, 30 years ago, the, the Dominion Post ran uh, two stories on the same page. They were juxtaposed on the same page. Uh, one story was about Parents Place, which was a group of uh, parents, mostly mothers, uh, who got together three times a week 
to, uh, to allow their children to play together. They all had young children somewhere between the ages of one and four before they went, they were preschool age children. So they got together and allow their children to socialize and then the parents would bring in, uh, they could socialize as well with each other and then they'd bring in people to, to talk to them about issues mostly relating to parenting, but, but basically anything that interested the group. And so uh, the Dominion Post ran a story on, on, on this parents' place and, and their activities and so on. And then next to that was a story on Parents Anonymous, which was a group that had formed, uh, similar to Alcoholics Anonymous, of uh, parents who um, were inclined to, not inclined, who, who had uh, basically beaten their children uh, and, and uh, abused their children, like physically abused their children, let's say. And so this group had formed to help to counsel the parents and to uh, provide uh, resources for them uh, and, and back up if they were in a situation in which they felt like um, they might be uh, tempted to abuse their child uh, and, and they could, uh, could get help on that. And then uh, next to both of these stories was a photograph of uh, the mothers uh, of, from parents place and uh, their children playing together and they were all identified by name. But unfortunately the caption to the, uh, to the photograph said uh, so and so and so and so members of Parents Anonymous <laughs> uh, gathered together at, at, uh, uh, to, uh, to enjoy each other's company or something to that effect. Uh, well, uh, Needless to say, there was a major retraction of this story the next day on the front page of, of the Dominion Post because uh, they could see the lawsuit coming, I'm sure. But it, it's a good example. That would be an example of, and clearly uh, you'd have fault in that, in that negligence in that case of, I mean, there, facially there was negligence. I mean, if you're, if you're describing a group as parents anonymous, a group who wants to remain, an remain anonymous, you don't publish their photograph and, and name in, in, the, in, the, in the newspaper. Um, and the final example uh, I have is, um, is a recent case, uh, fairly recent, about 10 years ago. Uh, Tom Selleck's father uh, found himself uh, being quoted in a tabloid. There are a bunch of these cases that involve tabloids. Uh, and uh, he was quoted as describing his uh, son, Tom Selleck, as being... Um, as having uh, trouble in his relationships with, uh, with women. Uh, and a whole series of quotes uh, describing how clumsy Tom was with women and how uh, difficult a time he'd had as a youth and so on. And, and none of it was true because they'd never interviewed Tom Selleck, uh, and, or, the, or his father, and, or Tom for that matter. Uh, so he sued and, and recovered uh, again on the theory that this was placing him in a false light in the public eye. Uh, oh, one final example. Um, it was a uh, National Enquirer story uh, claiming that this 80-year-old, uh, this octogenarian down in Arkansas had uh, had a baby, uh, had born a child, which was uh, totally untrue. And uh, so, so she sued the National Enquirer, and the Enquirer, the Enquirer's uh, defense was, well, nobody would believe what's in, printed in our newspaper, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, they lost. Uh, there is a West Virginia case on this, uh, which at least answers the issue left open after Time Inc. versus Hill and, and the combination of Gertz. It's a case called uh, Crump versus Beckley Newspapers, uh, a 1983 case. Uh, the the uh, what is the Register Herald down there had run a, a story several years before this on women in uh, coal mining. Uh, women in the late 70s had just started to get into coal mining. Uh, it was very unusual to have women in the coal mines. And uh, Crump uh, was one of these uh, women coal miners. She was interviewed and there was a photograph taken of her and, and which she consented to and was, she was fine with the article. Uh, was uh, flattered to be included, I think. Uh, and then several years later, uh, the paper ran a story on sexual harassment of women in the coal mines, some of which was pretty um, dicey, let's say. Uh, and they used a picture, uh, the, the picture they had taken of Crump uh, in, in the story. She was a woman coal miner, and so they just stuck that picture in with, without her consent. And uh, she sued them on both defamation and false light theories. And uh, the Supreme Court of Appeals of West Virginia uh, 
um, affirmed that uh, that case um, was actionable and uh, decided that uh, Gertz did in fact qualify timing versus Hill. Crump being a private figure, therefore, she only had to show that the newspaper was negligent in using her photograph um, and, uh, and, and thus al al allowed recovery there. Good. Yeah, sure. Um, I know there are papers anyway. A lot of times we'll use photos uh, beyond their original purpose mm -hmm. as special sections uh, where the picture uh, may not be related to the story or it may be featured in an ad or different things. So we're at risk in that every time we do that? Is the No, uh, only if you... The, the, the key in, in the Crump case was that they, they not only used the picture without her consent, but it, it, the use of the picture implied that she had been a victim of this sexual harassment and had to uh, uh, pr put up with it in, in the coal, to work in the coal mines. And uh, her claim was that she had never been harassed, uh, had not been victimized, and she felt that this represented her in a, in a way which was both defamatory and personal. And the Supreme Court agreed. So I, I mean, I, so uh, are you exposed in using pictures without individuals' consent? Yes, if you're using them in connection with a story which could, uh, if, if it's in a context in which that in, could infer that they're being, um, that's defamatory or, or personal and private in nature. Yeah, Tom? Yeah, I've, I've seen um, articles, and I'm sorry I can't cite them, but uh, there is a danger with using photos with unrelated stories, um, particularly if it would be something embarrassing. And it's not just print. I think there's some broadcast people here. When you are finding uh, B-roll, does everybody know that term, which I've learned in the last few years? Um, you know, if you have a story about uh, sexually transmitted diseases or, or, or uh, condition or whatever and you just want to have instead of having the talking head showing and you just find some b-roll that you have of people on the street if those people are recognizable I've, I've seen and I, I wish I had the citation for this but um, that has led to lawsuits on false light lawsuits so you I mean you want to be careful uh, one of the things I tell my students is what if that were your picture that that'll lead you probably to the right even if you don't know who that person is, what if you were shown there with that story or with that report? So um, it's something you want to be careful with, I think. Yeah. I, as a footnote to the false light tort, I should mention, it, it obviously, the, after the Crump case, it's recognized in West Virginia. Um, it's, it's, um, there's some conflict among the states, however, uh, with regards to, to recognizing that particular tort. Um, the Time Inc. versus Hill case came out of New York, which has recognized the tort for quite some time. Um, but some states have, have uh, declined to go that route and have said that it's subsumed by defamation. But we do have it in, in West Virginia. Sure. The Dominion Post example you gave, and I think you said that it didn't end up in court. Right. Uh, that, I can certainly see negligence, but it certainly was an accident at the same time. Right. Uh, would that not be a defense in that? them? You don't think that would hold? I mean, it certainly wasn't, I, I think, not intentional. Uh, clearly not. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 in West Virginia, that would have been actionable because it was clearly negligent. I mean, I, I don't know how you could avoid the finding of negligence, <laughs> you know, in a, a picture of a parent's anonymous. Uh, and uh, so it was clearly negligent, and it was clearly uh, false, and it was clearly uh, damaging to them, uh, to the women whose picture was was published, in terms of their, both their reputation and not to mention their feelings. Uh, I remember this case because my wife was one of those, uh, one of those in the photograph, and we our phone was ringing at about seven, a, seven o'clock a.m. And, uh, and we were talking to the Dominion Post at 10 after. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, as I said, they, they ran a very prominent retraction the next day and it satisfied people. Yeah, Ben? Um, I was wondering, how does this pertain to publishing uh, news photos? For instance, you know, if public broadcasting takes a photo, how, how it's published on a social media site. We had an instance where someone was trying to share from our web page 
a story on Facebook, and when they did that, the photo that accompanied, the photo that was the picture that accompanied the story, there was a mix-up on, on the website, and one of our employee photos, a photo of our employee, was put with the story. The story was about the wheeling shooting suspect. Mm -hmm. That was the headline, and if you saw the photo, it was a photo of one of our employees. So our employee could have sued, and I would, I would assume, yeah, defamation and false light. Yeah, yeah, yeah they could have, so, for sure. So, does I guess the towards does, does the law is it the same for you know publishing on a social media site? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I that that it's a good point. Um, in in each of these torts, um, the courts have uh, not distinguished between media and non-media defendants, and I think that's correct. Um, that that and it, and it benefits media and benefits individuals as well. That I mean, there are some cases out there that say, for example, uh, non-media defendants are, are not entitled to invoke the New York Times versus Sullivan privilege, and I think that's dead wrong. Uh, and the Supreme Court granted cert on it once, uh, and then decided the case on other grounds. But uh, one of the cases I'll talk about later. Um, shortly, um, implies very strongly there's no distinction. And, and uh, the Citizen United case as well is very, um, that's the uh, campaign finance case, is emphatic uh, in the fact that uh, in that case um, media uh, have uh, the same First Amendment rights as, as other individuals and, 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 and non-media uh, speakers have the same rights as media speakers. And so if you'll recall in, in Citizens United, the, the campaign finance law permitted uh, newspapers and the like to editorialize in the 60 days before an election, but they wouldn't allow a corporation to engage in uh, electioneering 60 days before an election. And the court said you, that distinction is, is not consistent with the First Amendment. And, and there, the BJF case I'm going to get to in a minute is, is, reinforces that. Okay, um, the last of, of the four torts at common law is a public disclosure of true private facts. Um, and, and there we have, uh, again we have the requirement for publicity, uh, more than just an exchange uh, privately. Uh, and uh, the facts in this instance must be true, that truth is an element of the tort, and uh, the, it must relate to, quote, private facts, the disclosure of which would be highly offensive to a reasonable person. Uh, and, and, and is not of legitimate public concern. So the, the disclosure must be highly offensive and did not relate to a matter of legitimate public concern. And so there are some serious constitutional uh, concerns with this tort. One, it relates to truth. Uh, and you can have other causes of action in which the disclosure is true. I mean, I mean copyright, for example, it deals with uh, true disclosures uh, and, and, and in other contexts. But uh, the, the Supreme Court has yet to approve of true disclosures being uh, uh, tortiously liable without something else being involved. Uh, and of course, there's the, the vagueness question, uh, the application of a standard so vague as, uh, quote, highly offensive to a reasonable person. And you might recall the, um, might recall it because it was uh, highly publicized, the Hustler case, uh, Hustler uh, Inc. versus Falwell, in which the court said uh, that there the tort was intentional infliction of uh, emotional distress. But um, the court said the outrageousness standard uh, under that tort is, is not capable of consistent application, at least as with regards to uh, uh, private figures. Um, so the, the Supreme Court has to date very assiduously uh, avoided uh, deciding whether this c can be uh, a tort which is consistent with the First Amendment, although it's had several cases before it uh, that have presented the issue. Uh, the first was Cox versus, Cox versus Cone Broadcasting, um, in which case a TV station revealed the name of um, of a, a rape victim. Uh, actually, I think she was uh, was a rape slash murder victim and Cox was her father and uh, sued uh, claiming that this was uh, this was an invasion of, of privacy um, and uh, the court in that case ruled um, 
I believe eight to one, and the, and the one dissent dealt with, went off on jurisdictional grounds, that because the TV station got the information, got the identity of the victim from the public record, it was privileged. And, and that remains true. It, it, if, if, the pub, if the information is obtained through a public record, uh, the disclosure is, is privileged. Um, the second case, well, there were two cases actually dealing with the disclosure of the names of juvenile defendants, one which was pretty close to home, the uh, Smith versus uh, the Daily Mail Publishing Company. Um, there used to be a, a, a West Virginia statute which made it a crime to um, publish the name of a, a juvenile defendant without permission of a, a circuit court. And um, the, uh, the Daily Mail uh, learned the name of a, it was a pretty a uh, highly publicized crime, I believe it was a murder case, and published the name of, uh, of the defendant who was a juvenile and uh, then got sued under, uh, well, it was a criminal statute. Uh, it was criminal to publish the name of a juvenile defendant. And, uh, uh, the, but the information, uh, this is where we get the, the, the basic, what's called the Smith principle, the Daily Mail principle. Uh, the court said, well, they obtained this information lawfully. Uh, I think they had a reporter at the, at, uh, the hearing. I believe he was transferred to a adult court. And <clears throat> he had, uh, the, the information was lawfully obtained. And, um, uh, and, and it was uh, obviously a matter of great public interest uh, related to a, a highly notorious uh, uh, crime and uh, the court said in that case the principle being that you cannot punish the disclosure of information that is lawfully obtained and relates to a matter of public concern without uh, furthering an interest of the highest order and, and the state did not have it in that case. There's, there's an interesting concurrence in the case by uh, Justice Ren then Justice Rehnquist uh, who concurred on the ground that the, uh, the statute only applied to uh, the print media. It did not apply to the broadcast media and in fact the TV station uh, in that case had, had run the, not only the name of but a photograph, <laughs> a, a videotape of, of the defendant and, uh, and had no liability under the statute and Rehnquist said well you can't discriminate between the media like that. But uh, the, the important part of that case was the principle that I, that I mentioned. And the final case <clears throat> was uh, BJF versus Florida Star. BJF was again a, a, um, a victim of sexual assault and, and Florida had a statute which prohibited uh, the publication of the names of uh, sexual uh, crime victims, sex crime victims. Um, but the um, the Florida St and the Florida Star actually had a, uh, a policy not to publish the names of uh, sex crime victims, but uh, they happened to have a uh, cub reporter uh, covering the police uh, logs one day, and he it it was just, somehow uh, the name of this victim was disclosed in a report. It was wrongly disclosed, but it was disclosed by the police. This guy picked it up and he, he published it in his report that night and he was unaware of the paper's policy uh, not to use the names of, of the victims. Um, so it got published and uh, BJF sued then in tort and relying upon this, um, this statute, uh, basically saying it, it created a per se cause of action for the public disclosure and publication of, um, of the name of the sex victim. The, uh, the Supreme Court reversed on, on several grounds. Uh, the main one being that, uh, again, applying the Smith versus Daily Mail principle, that the information was lawfully obtained and uh, it was a matter of public interest. Uh, crime is a matter of, of public concern. Uh, and uh, the state, uh, while it might have uh, a, an interest of the highest order in, in, in individually, in case-by-case -case basis, to protect the names of sex victims, it, this per se rule was overbroad. And you can imagine, you can, well, the, the case that comes to mind was also out of Florida, and that was when William Kennedy, I think his name was William, uh, Ted Kennedy's nephew, was accused of a rape on, in, on Palm Beach. And, uh, and, and I, I recall the debate the New York Times had about that, about whether to publish the name of the, the victim, and eventually it decided to do so. But uh, and this, the point being that there are these high-profile cases in which um, the name of the victim could be a matter of, of great public concern. Now, there could be individual cases where you might allow recovery, but you can't have this per se rule. And then another part of the holding it go, relates back to the point I was talking about earlier. The uh, the, the, the rule only applied to the media. It did not apply to individuals. 
And the court said you can't make that distinction. If, if it, the under-inclusion there was the problem, that, and Scalia's concurrence was specifically based on this, that um, if you're, you're, you, you can't prohibit the media from making disclosures if you're going to allow individual cases. Um, so the, 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 the main issue under this tort is, huh? Yeah. <laughs> what? Another 15 minutes. Probably total or uh, that'll that'll be enough. Um, I, I'm reaching the end here. I, I, I did want to elaborate a little bit on uh, what makes this tort. What is uh, uh, what is highly offensive to a reasonable person? <clears throat> um, and, and a couple of examples, I guess. Um, wh there was a New Yorker article which was the subject of this tort, a call, case called Sidis, S I D I S. Um, versus whoever publishes in New Yorker, and uh, basically it was one of those "Where are they now?" articles. Uh, they went back. Uh, Citus was a child prodigy, uh, was a genius, and you know went to MIT at the age of eight or something like that. I don't remember. And uh, and but then had uh, after he sort of reached this had reached stardom, if you will, because of his uh, prodigal intelligence. Uh, prodigious intelligence, he uh, basically went underground and became a loner and, uh, and, and, and valued his privacy very much, let's say. So they ran this Where Are They Now article disclosing all these details about the guy uh, and, and he sued over it and basically the Second Circuit said, well, uh, you know, this was intrusive uh, and, and certainly done, published without his, his consent, but nevertheless it was a matter of public interest and it was not highly offensive. Um, and uh, uh, another case is, is a, a fairly well-known case, uh, Melvin versus Reed. Um, there was a movie back in the early 30s called The Red Kimona. And the movie uh, was about a woman who had been a prostitute and then basically uh, turned her life over and went, went straight, if you will and uh, was, was now a, a, a happy a housewife. Uh, a, a, a truly a, a human interest story, but the, the idiots used the actual name of the woman, uh, both her maiden name and married name, and, uh, which caused the, the woman to, uh, to suffer greatly. That court said, uh, this was before the First Amendment came into play, but that court said uh, the fact that you used her actual name made this uh, actionable. Um, a, a case which I think is clearly wrongly decided, uh, a, a Ninth Circuit case called Vir Virgil versus Time Inc. It was a story, uh, Sports Illustrated did a story about um, this uh, surfing location where people engaged in body surfing and, and to do it at this particular location was apparently very dangerous. And they featured in this uh, article uh, uh, the guy, guy named Virgil, um, who was, uh, he was basically called the, the wild man of Big Sur or something like that, whatever the name of the beach was. And uh, the article featured stories about him, like the time he uh, put out a cigarette butt in his mouth and the time he burned a cigarette on his hand. Uh, he would jump downstairs to impress the girls. Um, he would uh, uh, intentionally injure himself when he was working construction so he could get, uh, go off work and get workers' comp, so he could go surfing, and a whole series of stories like that in which, uh, with illustrating um, uh, just how wild this guy was, and uh, quoted him as, as saying, uh, I think I might have been drunk most of the time and I might have destroyed most of my brain and so forth. Uh, he had it, it consented to an interview and then he withdrew the consent. And Sports Illustrated ran the article anyhow, and the Ninth Circuit said that this was uh, this met the terms of the the tort, uh, even though it seems to me the disclosure did not reveal anything highly. It was not a highly offensive disclosure. They just revealed what a wild man he was, and uh, and the fact that the, they made the tort turn on his withdrawal of consent is is horrible. You can't have. Uh, the object of a media story being the editor making the decision about whether to publish or not, uh, all of which got lost on the Ninth Circuit. But it seems to me that's a case which illustrates sort of the opposite of what the court held, that that would be uh, disclosures of what would be of, of uh, considerable public interest, actually. Um, another case um, which uh, generally is agreed was actionable was a case in which uh, Time magazine took a photograph of a woman who had a, um, a disease which, called, which caused uh, considerable, uh, well, gross obesity, let's say. And they photographed her in her hospital room in her dressing gown. Uh, 
and then I ran that photograph and uh, the, uh, the, that court, which was a, as I recall, a New York State court, uh, granted recovery. Uh, the best effort uh, that I've seen at capturing the essence of this tort and, tr and trying to give it some, some content was, uh, is an article by Thomas Emerson, who was a highly regarded uh, First Amendment commentator back in the 60s and 70s. And he wrote an article, I believe it was his last article, uh, in 1979, and he tried to give it, the tort, some definition. And, uh, and, I, and I think he succeeded. Uh, he said, the emphasis is on intimacy. Uh, that is, a disclosure about those activities, ideas, or emotions that one shares only with those who are closest, if at all. And then he uh, said things like sexual rela relations, bodily functions, medical conditions, as in the Barber case, the obesity case, uh, family relations, and the like, uh, of home and person. Those things about, that you share only with those closest to you, if then. Uh, and then he qualified that by saying, um, disclosures in incidental to formal proceedings or derived from public record are absolutely privileged, which is what the Supreme Court eventually held in, in Cox versus Cone Broadcasting. And the extent to which the person has waived privacy is, is uh, a factor. So if you have a all-purpose public figure, you know, a president of the United States basically has no privacy, uh, or glamorous, <coughs> well-known movie stars, much the same. Um, that j virtually any story about them is a matter of public interest. So, uh, I, and I think that gives you some idea of, of the, the content uh, of, of the tort. Yeah? I want to come back to uh, you talking about the uh, public record privilege, and I, I maybe other people weigh in on this, because one of the things I see now in our, urge, in our urgency to get things out first in social media, uh, we have privilege under public record. But often, before police release a name or something, it's out on social media, it's being reported that the individual is, or so-and-so is. And I have seen published reports where uh, they refer to a name and say, this person was identified as. Or, so we would, would we lose our privilege if it is identified in social media and it's common knowledge the name, even if it's correct, but it hasn't been released through any public record. And a, 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 a newspaper or a radio station or a TV station would refer to some, somebody in that sense and then find out something later that it's wrong or there's a problem. Uh, it, so it's not through a public record, but it's public knowledge. How, how do we, where would we fall in that? I, it would not be privileged, but um, if it's true, then you know, truth, uh, would, be, truth, truth would be a defense, uh, you know, unless it relates again to a very private fact, um, and uh, and certainly truth is a, is a defense to anything that's defamatory, uh, and and this is a very very narrow tort. I mean, it's a v there are relatively few cases dealing with public disclosure of true private facts. So, uh, and I, I would think a, a media would be on notice if it if it's of such a private nature that it could be potentially actionable, the, the media ought to know better than to publish that. Can I ask, I know that I've been in times with, with my paper where we have held a name because we couldn't get an official name, even though I've heard that name on radio, I'm not, I'm not to pick, or another paper. Has anyone else held the same thing that you hold off until you get the official? Absolutely. Even if you're, you know, you're pretty certain. Even if they're obituary. Yes. Yeah. Hold off till we get our own primary source, like the next door neighbor. You know, we've gone with that. It doesn't have to be official, especially if everybody else has a name. You try. You know, we're, we're competitive. Yeah, I should say the Supreme Court has not yet held that that tort is consistent with the First Amendment. But I think there's a pretty strong inference from the BJF case that a, a state could say it has an interest of the highest order such that it could allow recovery on, on a case-by-case -case basis, fact-by-fact, -fact, uh, for uh, public disclosure of facts which are highly offensive to a reasonable person. Yeah, Tom. Um, and that'll probably come up in the libel lecture, too, when you're talking about the privilege and stuff. But uh, with regard to privacy, one thing that I always, you know, you have a lot of worries, but children that are in news events. Let's say there's a school bus crash. I would send a photographer out, and if I got a picture of the kids there, I felt pretty safe 
running them. Now, at some point, though, and I don't know whether it's by statute or what, but I, I feel like I could, I feel that I couldn't go to a playground and shoot, shoot a camera, two kids playing, and get their name and put it in the paper. Is, is there any legal thing you can tell us with regard to that, when you need a parent's permission, when you are um, covering minors? Yeah, um, it's a couple things. Um, there are uh, federal restrictions on disclosure, disclosures relating to uh, educational data, for example. Uh, now that's, uh, and I must admit, I don't know. It, it certainly, uh, the federal law uh, restricts the ability of, say, WVU from releasing grades or any information at all about, um, about students and, and discipline relating to them and so on. Uh, which is why, you know, if you, if you ask um, Coach Huggins about his latest recruit uh, and whether he's qualified and whether he has academic troubles, and so, you know, he's going to say, well, I can't tell you. And if they impose discipline on a student athlete or a student, period, uh, that is also required to be kept private. The, the, what I can't tell you is if, if the, a newspaper, I assume, if a newspaper lawfully obtains the information, uh, they can use it, I think. Uh, and, and that would be true of, uh, and, and of course, educational data relating to uh, underage students, uh, under students still in grade school or uh, high school as well. I, I, it seems, um, and, and let me give you a, a couple specific cases. Uh, there was a, uh, a case in West Virginia. Uh, the um, County, uh, Kanawha County prosecutor's son, uh, prosecuting attorney's son, was uh, being subjected to some school discipline, and the uh, the prosecutor challenged that as an, ind an individual citizen, and uh, circuit court held a hearing on it. Uh, Judge Hope from uh, Boone County was uh, uh, Lincoln County was sitting by designation, and he closed the hearing. And the Supreme Court upheld that because it involved a juvenile. So the law provides protections to juveniles, and of course, all, all juvenile proceedings in this state are, are closed uh, unless it's transferred to adult court. Uh, all matters relating to juveniles in domestic and family court are closed. So the law protects the juveniles. Now, if the media acquire the information, uh, and uh, it's, it relates to a matter of public concern, in my opinion, they can use that information and disclose it, including the names. Um, there is, however, I mean, I think if it relates to private facts, you might have some exposure. There's a case out of uh, Mississippi called Deacon versus some newspaper, in which the newspaper went in and took a photograph of a special ed class. And that court held it action. Well, that was, uh, was a case of a public disclosure of a true private fact. They felt that uh, even though, obviously, the students at the school knew the identity of these children, that uh, putting in a newspaper could create a liability. I'm not sure the Supreme Court of the United States would have upheld that, but nevertheless, uh, there is some exposure if you're disclosing private facts, possibly. Uh, and the key in that case was the fact that it would involve children. Um, let me uh, mention, uh, I said I, there were two federal statutes I wanted to bring to your attention. One of them I've already mentioned, uh, the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe, Safe Streets Act of 1968 included provisions uh, at 18 U.S.C. sections 2510XX relating to interception of uh, wire and oral uh, um, communications, and that has then, uh, later, uh, that statute was amended to include uh, wire, oral, and electronic communications. So uh, any interception of uh, telephone calls or pr private conversations um, or uh, email uh, is prohibited by federal law and creates both civil and criminal liability. Uh, so if you plant a bug in a phone, that creates liability. Uh, you plant a bug in a space uh, and, and, uh, and listen to it or record it, the conversations, uh, that creates liability. Uh, That's a clarification. When you were, when the first tweet you were talking, and I wasn't clear understood, 
paper didn't, I think it was the Roach case, the paper didn't plant the bug. Well, no, not the Roach case, but the paper didn't plant the bug, but it got the report. Right. It wasn't sure of the source, and it ran the report. I wasn't clear when you stated, was the paper at risk there by doing that or not? Oh, it was at risk, but uh, the Supreme Court said because of the high degree of public interest in what was communicated in the, in the uh, conversation and, and, the, and what became then a publication, uh, the statute could not be applied to them constitutionally. Simply because of the context of the conversation, right. not the action. Okay. Right, right. Um, so, uh, so it, as I said, the, the, the federal law creates civil and, and criminal liability for that interception. Most states have similar kinds of laws. Uh, we do in West Virginia with regards to uh, um, uh, wiretaps and the like. Um, and, and now it, it also includes uh, gaining access to stored information, so uh, including voicemail and uh, stored email. Um, so it, 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 it's unlawful to uh, gain unconsented access to such uh, messages. Uh, and then there are uh, exceptions for uh, the ordinary course of business. Uh, so obviously a, an employer who, say, runs a telemarketing uh, firm can listen in on conversations and frequently you get that message when you call someplace that this this uh, this conversation may be monitored for business purposes or something to that effect. Uh, pursuant to search warrant of course uh, and as we're finding out now to our um, to a great extent national security uh, and and a, there's a split in the circuits on whether there's a there's, there's an a, an exception created by case law for domestic conflicts um, and, and I think that that is not consistent with the statute but there is a there is some case law saying that there's a, an exception for domestic conflicts that is not the case in West Virginia um, and the other statute I wanted to mention is, is called the uh, Privacy Protection Act of 1980, which was a uh, congressional reaction to the Stanford Daly versus Zurcher case in which the Supreme Court said it was okay to go in and uh, to get a search warrant to go into the Stan Stanford Daly had taken some pictures of an uh, anti-war protest rally and uh, there was apparently some criminal activity or some vandalism that resulted and so the police went in and searched the uh, the Stanford Daily offices for uh, uh, photographs uh, for evidence of, of who committed the crimes and the Stanford Daily sued saying you, you, you can't you can't have newsroom searches and you can't go in and just turn the police loose inside of a newsroom and uh, Supreme Court said oh yes you can <laughs> uh, and said uh, you know as long as it's uh, a lawful search warrant you can do that and it's the paper's argument it had been that you have to use a, um, uh, a subpoena. You had to, they had to get the information through a subpoena. Uh, and so Congress responded to that by act, enacting this Privacy Protection Act of 1980, which is at 42 U.S.C. sections 2000 AA, little a's, et sec. And basically it says it is unlawful. And, and it applies to both state and federal um, it applies to all persons. It's unlawful to search or seize the work product of any person reasonably believed to have a purpose to disseminate information to the public through a newspaper, book, broadcast, or similar public communication. So it's very broad in its scope. It applies to all, basically all journalists and, and people who want to communicate generally with the public. Uh, and, and then there are certain exceptions, uh, unless there, there's a reasonable basis for believing the materials contain child pornography or uh, it's necessary to prevent death or serious injury, it meaning the search, um, or the probable cause to believe the person is committing a crime or is about to destroy the evidence. Um, and, and, but you have to have reasonable basis for, for all of those e exceptions. Um, okay. You got any time? I'm out of time. Do you want to wrap up? Uh, that's my wrap. <laughs>